Many of us tend to associate mountains with rugged wilderness, where people are sparse and economic growth is slow, long-distance trade and communication is limited by the rough terrain. In our minds, it's on the low plains and gently rolling hills where civilization really sprawls and where people erect great cities. This is where the real political power of the region is. At best, the people of the civilized lowlands treat the mountains like semi-wild backwaters. But in many parts of our world, the reality is exactly the opposite. The great cities and roads follow the mountains, the endless farmland rolls across mountain slopes, and it's the lowlands where scattered communities etch into the wilderness. Today, we'll discuss those mountain civilizations and why they exist. In many ways, it's not unreasonable to associate low elevations with large human populations, urbanization, and political power. The vast majority of the people on our planet live below 200 meters in elevation. There are many reasons for this. For one, there's no better place for trade than along coastlines and along navigable rivers, which wind across flat plains. Moving goods across water is by far the most cost-effective method of transport, and this was especially true in the past, when even small lowland rivers were the best way to move goods, and digging canals to connect those rivers is easy on a flat plain. It's been done since antiquity. Farming, too, has many advantages on low hills and plains. When you plow soil on steep mountain slopes, it's highly vulnerable to erosion, and building terraces to reduce that erosion is very labor-intensive. Farming lowland areas is a breeze by comparison. Finally, it's difficult to build roads across rugged terrain. Before rock blasting technology, this was especially true. And without many effective roads, there are many downstream consequences. For one, it's difficult for any large political entity to develop. How can you enforce a law or collect a tax if your army struggles to move across a territory? Overland trade will also be difficult or impossible. All of these factors make low elevations more favorable for human population growth, urbanization, and strong governments. They're relevant today and they were even more relevant in the past. But despite all these factors, we can still see the script flipped completely in many regions. Kenya's largest city, Nairobi, sits at 1,795 meters above sea level, or 5,500 feet, more than a mile high. It actually gets hotter in New York City than it does here, thanks to the elevation. The largest cities in Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Yemen are even higher, higher than 2,200 meters or 7,000 feet in elevation. In all four of these countries, the majority of people live above 1,500 meters or nearly 5,000 feet. Although all these countries have vast lowland regions, the mountains and plateaus are the core of economic and political life. Many of us in the United States aren't aware of this, but all those same statistics apply to the country just south of our border. Mexico is a very mountainous country, with three major mountain ranges surrounding a vast interior plateau. The Trans-Mexican Volcanic Belt in the south is particularly densely populated. And that pattern basically continues into Guatemala, where most of the cities are centered on the highlands. The Andes produce a similar effect at tropical and subtropical latitudes. If you look at this map of Colombia, you'll see most people live either along the Caribbean coast or in the mountains. The lowland regions on either side are very sparsely populated, and the largest city rises well above 2,600 meters or 8,500 feet. The majority of people in Bolivia live above 2,500 meters or 8,000 feet. A third of them live above 3,500 meters or over 11,000 feet. Bolivia has vast lowland regions but the mountains are where most of the people are. This pattern breaks down farther south in more temperate latitudes, just as it does in North America. Throughout the tropics and subtropics, we often find that the mountains and plateaus are where people concentrate. What could be the cause behind this geographic pattern? Well, it's often assumed that this is just the legacy of colonialism, that Europeans preferred cooler climates which were 
more like home, and once they gained political power over the regions, they funneled resources toward the mountains. But there's a problem with that assumption. This pattern usually predates colonialism. The largest city in Madagascar, Antananarivo, sits at about 1,300 meters, over 4,000 feet. When the French arrived, this was already the most important city in Madagascar. It was ruled by the Marina Kingdom, who dominated the central plateau and held political control over the entire island. Their ancestors sailed over 4,000 miles from Indonesia to Madagascar around 400 AD, bringing with them rice and taro to cultivate. The Marina Kingdom featured vast rice paddies and fortified palaces with rigid hierarchy, a powerful monarchy, and iron weapons. Although Madagascar was of great strategic importance to France, control of the island was not easily acquired. In New Guinea, outside influence has mostly been limited to the coastline, and yet we see from this map that people tended to cluster in the highlands. In the Americas, a network of cities and roads followed the mountains like veins, long before Columbus. The Aztecs, the Highland Maya, and the Incas had already established a foundation of highland cities and trade routes. The Spanish simply placed their own version on top of it. Throughout the tropics and subtropics, civilizations sprung up on mountains and plateaus long before European colonial influence. To add to that point, highland regions of the tropics and subtropics are not just like home for any European. You can't find the climate of Berlin anywhere on a tropical mountain slope. That's because tropical latitudes lack the same seasonality. You can find elevations in Ecuador where it's always cool and spring-like, or always just below freezing, but seasons hardly vary. In the outer tropics, there is more seasonality, but those seasons are quite different from those of Europe. Winter is generally the dry season in the outer tropics, and that forces people to deal with a huge temperature variation over 24 hours. The clear, dry air and high elevation leads to rapid cooling at night, but the following day will be surprisingly warm with intense sunshine. Everyone who lives here has adapted their clothing, home, and daily routine to these sudden temperature changes. On the other hand, snow accumulation is very limited even where nights get well below freezing. That's because winter is the dry season and because the days are warm and sunny. In short, tropical highlands have unique climates of their own, entirely unlike those found elsewhere. All that being said, tropical mountains have allowed for more cultural exchange between high-latitude and low-latitude societies. Cheese, for instance, has become incredibly important in much of tropical Latin America, in large part thanks to mountain ranges. You see, most cattle in the tropics are zebu, or Brahmin cattle, a species called Bos indicus, descended from the Indian auroch. They're better adapted to heat and tropical diseases than any cattle from Europe. But the most productive dairy breeds are all European breeds of Bos taurus, a different species which suffers in hot and humid climates. Mountain ranges allow for those specialized dairy breeds to be raised. The same factors apply to some crops too, like barley and wheat, both of which are only grown at high elevations in the tropics. Back to the main topic, throughout the tropics and subtropics, we've seen that mountains and plateaus can often become the center of human development. This has happened independently all around the world. Are there any universal factors behind this trend? Well, some geographers have suggested that tropical diseases could play a role. That certainly seems plausible. Mosquito-borne illnesses like malaria, yellow fever, and dengue fever are all strictly limited by elevation. Cooler air temperatures limit the growth cycle of the pathogens that cause these diseases. And in mountainous regions, fast-flowing rivers aren't an ideal habitat for mosquito larvae. Another factor that has been suggested is soil fertility. Soil in the tropics can often be very poor because the water-soluble minerals critical for plant growth have slowly been leached out of the soil by heavy rainfall over millions of years. But volcanic eruptions and the weathering of rock can reintroduce those critical minerals. In addition, mountains can provide the orographic rainfall 
needed to support crops and livestock in otherwise arid regions. Finally, the terrain at high elevations is not always a major limitation for trade and communication. No doubt, rugged landscapes are difficult to traverse and build roads across. Rugged landscapes encourage isolation, but elevation and ruggedness aren't necessarily correlated. Denver, Colorado is at a high elevation, but traveling from Kansas City to Denver, you won't even notice you went uphill. Our Great Plains are basically a giant ramp, 300 miles at the base and one mile high. That's not the kind of slope anyone will notice. Smooth plateaus are easy to traverse and build roads across. The Appalachians of West Virginia and Kentucky are basically the opposite. Most of these mountains aren't very high at all, even relative to the Appalachians. But because the landscape is incredibly rugged, the people here have dealt with significant isolation throughout history. That's why the technical definition of hill people or mountain people, according to the WCMC, takes landscape ruggedness into account. Mountain people meet one of two criteria. They live above 2,500 meters, or they live above only 300 meters if the land is rugged. If a plateau has wide valleys or playas you can build roads across, isolation isn't so inevitable. And speaking of roads, one piece of technology has completely changed the game for people who live high above navigable rivers and coastlines. Before the railroad, there was an enormous gap in transport cost between water and land. Railroads and locomotives significantly reduced that gap, expanding the possibilities for people on plateaus and mountains. Of course, it goes without saying that hundreds of factors influence human geography. One of the most exciting aspects of this field is that simple, overarching rules are difficult to make. The real world is far more puzzling, more varied, and more colorful. Thanks for watching. If you find these topics interesting, consider subscribing. There will be many more to come.